Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor. I'm the Director of Education here at the Southampton History Museum. And this morning, we're joined by Jackie Serbinski. Uh, she's a professor at Kingsborough College working in the business department. And she has done uh, plenty of programs here at the museum and with the Rogers Memorial Library over the last 10 years. And I believe is, in fact, a former board member here at the museum. Um, and in fact, earlier just this year, I believe in July, uh, she gave yes. a talk about uh, 1950s fashion. Uh, so we're jumping ahead a little bit, going to the 1970s. Um, but today is going to be another great, interesting talk. Um, hopefully, everybody here ha has some questions afterwards. And if you do, please submit those through the, either the Q&A function or the chat function, which you should see on your Zoom toolbar. After this talk's over, I will jump back into the call, and I'll read your questions to Jackie, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a nice little dialogue about everything she talked about today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to you. And enjoy everybody. Thanks, Connor. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Um, when I was asked to do another program, uh, Penny and I were talking about Penny Wright and I were talking and uh, she asked me, you know, what decade would I think would be interesting? And I thought the 70s because it was so volatile. And so, um, as you can see, uh, my title is uh, anti fashion, but with all the trimmings. So this was, it. if you if you live through that period, which I'm sure many of you did, you know that it was, when we look at it in, in, in entirely, it, it seems almost unbelievable that we survived it. Um, many of you may have seen, remember this, how it all began, um, our energy crisis at the beginning of the 70s. Those of you who are driving at that time and needed our cars, um, where there was a gas uh, shortage because there was an oil embargo. And so, we found ourselves on gas lines at five in the morning, um, depending on where you lived. Um, if you had an odd li license plate, you went one day and you had an even license plate, you went the other. So that sort of like kicked off the 70s. So I describe it as sort of a pivot of change where anything goes. And if you look at this, um, you can see why the 70s was so volatile. Um, some of these, some of the key events that um, we can all remember or read about. Certainly, the, the women's movement was very dramatic. Uh, more than half of the mothers were working outside the home. So there was definitely economic liberty for many women. Um, of course, Vietnam continued. And so we had a very strong anti-war movement. And then in 72, of course, Watergate, um, and along with the oil embargo, which led to our economic recession, on the upside, we did have space exploration, which was very hopeful. Um, a lot of new technology, that was the beginning of PCs, VCRs, and cell phones. Um, environmentalism was a very strong um, theme as well. And later we'll see how disco and its music uh, had a great influence on the United States. In 72, Nixon opened China. I remember I traveled to China in 72, but right before the border was open, I was there on business for the May department stores and um, I made, I could only get to the, to the border. I wasn't allowed to cross over because the, I think it was in after February of 72. Um, we talked about ethnic pride and gay liberation also in the seventies, the equal rights amendment, pop culture was very strong. Um, and it was reflected in a society. And if you look at these numbers <clears throat> from 1970 to 76, the average cost of a home was $22,500. Um, by the end, it climbed to 58,005 over that period of time. The average income was a little under $10,000 up to 17,005. Gas was 38 cents. And it jumped over, almost over a dollar, really. I remember that when the oil embargo finished. Um, and the new cars um, jumped from $3,900, a little under $4,000 to almost $6,000. Certainly sounds a lot less than what we pay now, but um, you have to think about you were in the 70s uh, and what the cost of living was at that time. So you may have read um, Tom Wolfe, who called this decade the me decade. And the reason he came up with this, as you can see here, he said, Americans felt very vulnerable due to this upheaval. So the, they had to think about what they control, could control. The only thing they could really control is themselves and their lives. So it led to a lot of individualism. They were dissatisfied with the war, with the politics. 
And so this was reflected in our clothing as well. We started to break all the rules in fashion and social expression of the self became dominant. So you almost, you look at these items here and you say to yourself, we wonder how we, um, we got through it all. So um, just to reiterate a little bit, this pop culture, how it impacted society. Let's see if I can move this down. Um, some of the major films at the time, Annie Hall, The Deer Hunter, The Godfather, The French Connection, American Graffiti. Um, when we looked at our sitcoms at the time, they all had a social consciousness theme. All in the Family, Mary Tyler Moore, who was representative of the single woman of the time, who was now independent and had a career, Sanford and Son. And in pop culture, we looked to Andy Warhol, if you remember. Some of the icons of the decade that we want to mention are Angela Davis, Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta, Lauren Hutton, Catherine Deneuve, Bianca Jagger, Liza Minnelli, Jan Birkin, and Gloria Steinem. So these are some names that when you look through the 70s keep coming up. So these are some of the events that we want to mention in the 70s before we get to how this affected our our fashions and our clothing. In 1970, we had the first space probe. Um, and so that was very exciting. Um, and right after that in 71, Gloria Steinem launched her magazine, Ms. Magazine. It was certainly a breakthrough because it was really representative of the women's movement of, of, of the time and certainly took us into the future. In 71, we had the opening of Walt Disney Parks. Um, which was the resort that we all know about um, and was very new at that time. And at the same time, we had the death of Coco Chanel. Uh, she died in 71. So she kind of represented the old school of the couture and the fashion industry. And now we were looking, we were turning the corner um, on how the couture was gonna respond to what we call this upheaval of the 70s. These are some of the other things that include on that list, um, Led Zeppelin's album of 71, um, Watergate, and MASH of certainly was an important um, sitcom of the time. Let me just go back. Um, you recognize these individuals here. So this sort of represented um, our anti-war feelings. Um, Watergate certainly had a, a traumatic effect on society. And in 73, we had the tennis match between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. Again, this was another um, step up for women where um, she defeated him at, in this tennis match. Um, so it really proved the fact that women can do the same thing as men, certainly, and just as well. And on the right side, we see the sitcom Charlie's Angels. These three women who were um, stayed on, well, their sitcom uh, really survived for many years and is representative of the single woman again. So what about women? Women were empowered. Women shared power. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was the first uh, female uh, prime minister of Great Britain. Um, we talk about sexual liberation, gender equality in wages, more young women reject the role of housewife, and all the a lot of the films and um, sitcoms validated this, such as Mary Tyler Moore and Annie Hall. And here we see to the right, a typical uh, shot from the film Annie Hall. We see Diane Keaton on the left and uh, of course, um, um, Woody Allen on the right. And on the extreme right, we see an outfit that we might envision of the 70s. What Annie is wearing, what Diane Keaton is wearing will become very important in the industry, not only for, uh, for women because it was more of a manly um, outfit. So what did they wear to work, women? Um, well, the dress on the right was really important. That was the Diane Van Furstenberg dress. Um, she made a lot of money. Lord & Taylor was one of the major stores that promoted it. Um, you probably own one. I know I did. We, any of us who were working um, owned one of these dresses. They fit everybody. They look great. Um, they traveled well. Uh, we also wore twin sets. Now, we called those twin sets because we call them cardigans and tees now, but at the time, they were described as twin sets matching um, cardigans and um, shells um, in the same color or same pattern. And of course, pantyhose and bodysuits were really important as well. We saw also that um, the silhouettes changed. 
Um, very wide lapels and broad shoulders uh, on the right. And right to our left, we see a lot of knits. This is when Missoni became very important. As you know, the Italian fashion as Missoni is known for its knits. But these were obviously other designs from other manufacturers, but we see the, the knits, the hats, and the boots that tuck under the skirt. And these are high boots. There's not the ankle boots that we see so much of today. So here's a shot of Missoni. Um, actually, it was founded in 53. Um, and it, of course, became the center of knitwear and became very important. Um, this outfit actually is 1975, as you can see. Um, and it consists of a herringbone weave headscarf, um, a striped top, and a maxi skirt. Even her linens are Missoni. So, and you can see how clever and how um, interesting, although they're different patterns, they work together because the colors sort of um, integrate. So this knits were very, very important. Women also wore very conservative suits. Um, they wore, uh, and here we see the vest again. This is the influence of Annie Hall. Very large glasses, oversized, certainly, but classic suits, conservative. These are working women. And we wore pants in 1970s, which may seem shocking to some people. Uh, we were now allowed to wear pants to work, which never, never, ever happened before. And so we see pants everywhere, both for casual and for work outfits. And again, the vest becomes important, that long skirt tucked with long high boots. Here we see Catherine Deneuve in 1970, uh, um, you know, uh, modeling one of the outfits. And of course, when we get to the youth, um, it's an entirely different uh, category. Young people were very um, anti-war, anti-fashion. Anything was allowed. Now, this is what we call style tribes. Style tribes are young people who wear a certain way of dressing so that they can be identified as belonging to a group. If you are part of this group, you're going to have on certain things that if I see you on the street, I know I can connect with you. This is a style tribe. And we see here these two young women to the right um, wearing their jeans. And jeans were really important. They were dominant. In 1971, Levi won the Cody, the Cody Award for his, their jeans. Um, so what we're talking about with style tribes is that there was not any one particular outfit, but they were, they would took, take current trends and they would mix it up with their own expression, as we see here. And it still exists today. Matter of fact, I'm teaching a fashion forecasting class and we're talking about style tribes today. And we're talking about um, where they originated. Um, there was one that started in Great Britain in the 70s, um, young men who adopted Edwardian looks and they all dressed the same, had the same hairdos, so this is an ongoing trend. Bad taste. Um, we had hot pants. We had platform shoes. Um, this was typical of young people. Um, they were anti-fashion. They were into shakas. Bell bottoms, as I said, were very, very important. Um, you can see one here in a knit. And this is a, a very um, extreme one, but it's in a geometric print in a knit. And you notice that the the way they get this um, uh, seam in the front of the pan is that it's heat set into the polyester. So you get that look and there of course is the platform shoe along with it. So bell bottoms were very important as well. And we see them in many places. We see them um, here on just a regular everyday outfit. And we see these young women together all wearing bell bottoms. And we're seeing a little bit of that coming back right now because trousers are getting wider. Um, we're moving from the very tight pants into a little more room and in some cases into a bell bottom. And punk. Punk was another illustration of anti-fashion by young people. Uh, we see here some of the really punk looks of the time. Black was of course very important. All these nail heads and um, fishnet and um, whatever. And they would mix it with things like, you know, like a little tutu uh, toil pink, toil pink skirt over here. Look at the, even their, their hats, their outfits. 
or very extreme. And here we see um, more punk, spiked hair, black leather jackets, very dominant. Um, and his hair on the left, he spiked it in pink um, and he has um, a jacket with metal trim on it. Um, very characteristic, as you can see here, of the punk of the time. And then we all may remember the safety pin dress. This is worn by Elizabeth Hurley. Um, and this is more punk. This is a safety pin dress. Um, this was designed by Versace, you might remember. So it was also the, the design, the couture business or the ready to wear business of the, of the designer market was also starting to embrace anti-fashion. They were breaking the rules as well. And of course, then we had disco. Um, the music was very important. And we see on the right here, those of you who remember the film Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta. Um, and then to our left is an outfit we might see. Uh, very, Lorex was very important, all this glitter. Um, and if you remember um, all the discos that opened, um, young people that went dancing, there was a lot of these glitter balls up above you um, and very, um, very in interesting. Here we see some more disco. On the left, we see Gloria Gaynor in 1975, who was a disco song stress. And here we see her in a glitter jumpsuit, um, truly fabulous looking in this outfit. Um, and over here, we have another group in 73, Sister Sledge, uh, singers of the disco track um, as well. So this was a very, um, and look, notice the bottom of their trousers as well are bell bottoms, although they're using that very, um, the metallic lorex um, fabric that was so popular of the time. Ethnic looks, very important. And we see that in the early days when we talk about um, ethnic um, looks and um, ethnic pride. Um, and we see it here. So right over here, we see the caftan. This is a, and I'll tell you, this was a very important item when I was at the, um, I think of when I was at the May Company, we sold hundreds of these um, because we were influenced by this among young people. And so we would have it manufactured both as blouses and long dresses. And over here to the left, we see a little bit more of this ethnic peasantry to our left, uh, the embroidery on the top and notice her headband around her head. Um, and then to the right, we have um, an, another um, ethnic, particularly the Afro um, was very popular at the time. So ethnic looks were important. And here we see more, more peasantry, um, these large florals. Here we see a typical peasantry um, midi dress. Uh, right over here, we have the, the suede with the, the um, sort of a um, Sherpa um, trim. And again, to the right, a very peasantry pattern, uh, which was typical of the time. Even Guy LaRoche um, in the couture market was influenced by this ethnic look. And here we see one that he did embroidered in Crepe Georgette in 1971. Very beautiful. But again, look at all the patterns are very reminiscent and representative of ethnic um, patterns that one might have in an authentic um, vintage costume. And what about the men? The men were we don't want to ignore them because they were very dominant in the 70s. Um, to the right, we see the leisure suit. This was a really important item. Um, it was a two-piece uh, shirt collar um, with the shirt uh, worn out like a jacket. Um, and they were made mostly in polyester. And a lot of them were in colors, in pastel shades as well. And on the left, we see this other young man. And he's wearing a polyester printed shirt. Um, pattern that was also very popular at the time. But leisure suits were very important for men. They had lots of options though. They could wear these things. So the left, we again see the leisure suit with that polyester print pattern shirt underneath their jacket. And here we see some more, notice the high waist um, on some of these models as well. Anything goes. And here we see the longer jacket. The neighbor jacket was really important. That's right here in the middle, um, sort of influenced by um, Premier Nehru. Um, 
longer jackets and um, turtlenecks, um, scarves replace ties. Men, some men still wore ties, but many of them did not, as you see here, a turtleneck or a scarf tied at the neck in place of the tie. So they're becoming much more, um, you know, menswear really hadn't changed much. And this is a really dramatic change in the menswear market. And here we see more men uh, from the little more conservative over here, of course, but then we go down to here and we see more um, um, two color outfits. We see the longer jacket uh, and we see over here, the pants also widening at the bottom. And of course, um, over here, we see the um, more colors in, in what they chose to wear. So men had a lot of variety in what they chose to wear. And here's some more. Um, here we see um, knits, jackets, vest jackets. Uh, and over here also, um, leaning towards sort of the punk um, look that we see on the left here. These are, these are from a couture show, but nevertheless, um, they're there because the designers were influenced by what was going on in society. And here we have some more men. Um, certainly there's a longer jacket. There's the ruffle jabot, um, the printed um, top under the longer jacket. So men wore a lot of color, print, really dramatic clothing. And designers got on board. Um, you know, on the left-hand side, we see these really dramatic um, sportswear looks. Um, this um, particular um, outfit on the left was de designed by Jean-Charles de Cachelbajac, um, who upgraded sportswear and work clothes. And on the right, we see that what this is, it's a laminate um, on um, raincoats with the collage of postcards underneath it. So it was very fanciful in a way. And to the right, we see the influence of ethnic. Certainly over here, this is inf very influential. When we think of the Asian influence, the kimono, uh, we see it right here. And also over here, we see more peasantry. We see more um, bold colors, which certainly you see in a lot of ethnic clothing. So this, the designers were very much uh, on board with what was going on. And glitter, we, when we look back at the um, disco, um, we also see David Bowie here in this um, sculptured um, glitter exaggerated jumpsuit. And to the right is a Miyake design this. Um, and it's really sort of like architectural um, pleading. Uh, again, using that idea of glitter and um, show-stopping um, images. And here again, um, one might wonder what inspired this. But again, we see this sort of, um, we see it here in the ethnic rep, the OB ties, um, also the colors, the pattern and the fringe certainly influenced by what we're seeing um, among young people. And to the right, we don't really know, we might, this is Valentino. Do we know what he really meant by this? And then some of the designers were very traditional as we see on the left here. So again, here making a statement, uh, perhaps it was because the world was really going in so many different directions. That's the way Valentino saw it. So designers do go bohemian. Uh, YSL went into a lot of folklore outfits, black leather jackets, his perfume opium was, came out. Um, Anti-fashion was the key concept to the couture. Everything was allowed. So at the end, what do we think about? Um, how did this all end? Well, for many, the late 70s were very troubling. There were a lot of radical movements and counterculture, you know, pushing, a, pushing against mainstream thought. Um, certainly Watergate, Vietnam, the economic crisis, the peace movement were very belligerent. And then we had the rise of the Black Panthers, the IRA, the PLO, and terrorism. And as Vietnam ends, the young are very pessimistic. But what's interesting too, what was happening because of this oil embargo and because of the price of home heating fuel, this leaked into our everyday lives. 
So in, in, when, you, when you were home, uh, we learned to keep our houses colder because it was more expensive um, to warm your house the way you normally might have. Thermal, thermal shirts. Now we used to see this just as underwear, but what happened in the seventies, we saw an opportunity to design thermal that could be worn as tops that kept you warm. So that was influenced by this whole oil and bar. And of course, the tights that matched um, the, the opaque tights and colors that women would wear along with their um, skirts. So right now, what's interesting to me is that these are recent shots. These just happened. Um, and these are how designers are seeing how the 70s is still influencing our lives today um, with velvet suiting, stacked heels, reminiscent of the platform, wide lapels right over here, and a glam rock vibe to Falls menswear. So if we look at these designers, we have YSL, uh, we have Hermé, we have Tom Ford and Givenchy. So all of these designers are, are being influenced, are looking back at an era. You know, we do that as designers, er, designers look back for inspiration. Obviously they're, they're kind of looking at what's happening now in the United States. And they're looking back at the 70s, sort of a mirror image of what we may be going through right now. And then they translate it into their current, um, in their current, um, the way they see it in clothing. So where did it go from there? At the end of the 70s, we sort of shifted gear. We left behind the punks and we started to look at one of the most, um, in some controversial maybe um, decades, the 80s, which was the rise of the yuppie. This is the upward professional. And we see here what they call the yuppie handbook. So this was the young urban professional who was taught to dress a certain way, um, you know, live a certain lifestyle, carry a certain kind of briefcase. Um, if you recall, women would wear their sneakers uh, to walk to work. And when they got to work, they changed to their heels. And so this is what sort of a transitional period that started to um, lead to what we call a decade of um, excess. Um, so maybe many of you would remember that. So, you know, looking back um, on this um, very interesting decade, um, it had massive changes um, economically, sociologically, in terms of pop culture, in fashion, and even global. And so, um, you know, we, we need to look back um, to understand where we're going in the future. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, that was that was a great talk. Let's see, we do have a couple questions. Okay. Um, so again, I will remind everybody, um, if you do have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A function or in the chat function, and we'll go through those now. So uh, let's see, we have one. Um, Oh, that's it. Oh, there, there are, I have a couple coming in now, so it's, just, it's moving on me. Let me make okay. Sure. There you go. Uh, will there be a recording of this talk? I can answer that one. Yes. Uh, so we are recording this talk now. It'll be on our YouTube page afterwards. So if you missed anything, you want to send it to a friend, um, it should be up within the week. Um, let's see. Uh, thanks for the background on the 70s, which, as you said, really set the tone for fashion. Uh, this was sent by Tom Edmonds, a director here, and he said, I was there. Um, I was not there, but uh, from doing a little bit of my own study and research and things like that, uh, I could definitely see examples of what you're talking about, about how, I mean, just right at the end, they're talking about why thermals came into being somewhat fashionable, uh, being directly related to an oil crisis. And then by somebody saying, uh, maybe a bit of a clarification rather than a, a question per se. It said, Elizabeth Hurley wore that dress in 94, um, and not in the 70s, but it was a nod to punk. But yes, I, I, th I think you said that or-, or Right. Or that. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a few questions. Um, what was your favorite decade style-wise? And that's from Penny at the library. 
I'm going to have to say um, probably um, uh, the 60s um, because I was getting out of college and I was um, living my dream, living in Manhattan, got my first great job, um, wore miniskirts and false eyelashes. And, uh, you know, I think it was a great time. Uh, and Manhattan was really wonderful at that time um, for young women could afford to live in New York um, and not make a lot of money, uh, but able to have a kind of inter a great experience. So I would have to say the 60s because of the music, the Beatles, um, you know, the whole Carnaby Street. I was working at the, uh, at the um, Federated Department stores when we were importing um, the clothing from Great Britain. And this was the whole um, um, Beatles uh, revolution that took place in the United States. So it was very exciting to be part of that. Oh, uh, we have somebody else asking, uh, do you remember the Huckapoo shirt for men? You said it's similar to the polyester shirt that you showed with large pointy collars. It's very familiar. It probably was very, um, today probably we would look and cringe at it, but I'm sure at the time it was very <laughs> um, coveted by some men. I'll say a lot, of, a lot of the men's fashion that you were showing, uh, the idea of me wearing it, I think makes me laugh and anybody that knows me would probably laugh as well. Uh, I definitely fit more into the punk category, specifically right. all black. Um. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, black recurs, all th you know, when we talk, look at, um, you know, Marlon Brando, he was really the first one to show us that wonderful black leather jacket. And it's sort of transcended time that we repeatedly go back to that jacket. That style has made money for lots and lots of uh, manufacturers. So it's, it's been great. People love it. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we have somebody, somebody in the comments saying that they actually do remember, they remember the Huckapoo shirt as well. Um, and then somebody else, uh, was the girl coat matching dress in the 60s? Um, I think that really was um, when Mrs. Kennedy was in the White House, that was in the early 60s, when John Kennedy was president. A lot of her outfits, if you remember, she wore those simple shift dresses with matching hats and um, coats perhaps sometimes and suit jackets. As we drifted out of the late, into the late sixties, things changed. Of course, um, after the assassinations and, um, you know, Vietnam, it began to heat up, things changed um, and the Beatles hit town and, and that really dramatically changed um, the way we dressed. So early sixties, I would say that would be. Um, so I'm, I'm bad with pronunciation sometimes. So they're asking a question about this person's name. Uh, F-I-O-R. U C C I. Rucci. Rucci. Uh, so they're asking if you remember the impact of their rap. They said desk, but maybe they meant dress. Well, the rap dress, uh, the, the major one was the DVF dress, the Dime von Furstenberg, which um, came out in the 70s and was an, the reason why it was so important because it was an American product. Um, you know, after, um, um, United States became more dominant in promoting its own clothing after the Second World War because we were cut off from Europe for so long. However, um, DVF was the, the premier wrap dress. Um, I'm sure this other one was as um, important, but um, the DVF sort of took the spotlight away and it was knocked off and made into by many other uh, brands at lower prices, certainly. And we see a resurgence of it. It's come back because it's such an easy thing to wear. Hmm. Um, let's see. I think I think that's the last of all the questions from the okay. from the group so far. Um, I have one last question. What What do you think has the the biggest impact um, from the seventies on today's fashion? Well, I think it out. has. Yeah, I think what it is. I think for me, um, because I teach a lot of, I teach kids that are, you know, between the ages of 18 and let's say 20, 21, 22, um, I'm more conscious of uh, what young people are thinking and what they're doing. Um, I think what's happening in the United States now um, has a lot, we can look back to the seventies and see um, the youth reaction to a current uh, sociological and political situation right now and kind of take from that some of the things that they did that we are doing or young people are doing today. And so I think that has a lot to do with um, 
what we're seeing currently in, in the way people, and, and we're moving away from traditional clothing. Um, lots of people are wearing clothes from thrift shops. They're not, um, they're not going into traditional retailers and buying clothes either as e-commerce online or when they can go to a store. So there is a, a movement away from the traditional way of buying clothes and putting them together yourself, which was very much like what we saw in the 70s with young people. Interesting. Well, this was a great talk. Uh, another one to add to the list. Um, I want to thank you again, Jackie, for joining You're us. Welcome, also, Connor. I want to thank the Rogers Memorial Library for helping to put this on today. Um, and I want to thank everybody that was watching for joining us. Uh, with all that said, hopefully we'll, we'll see you down the road in one of our next programs and have a good day. Thank you, Connor. Take care. Bye-bye.